Hereford. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'll try again. Uh, for those who haven't met me, I um, oh, I've got to click got it. Um, I work for the Herefordshire and Worcestershire Earth Heritage Trust. And um, in this case, I am doing the project management on the Birmingham's Erratic Boulder project, but I've done quite a few other projects as well. Um, I was previously, for those who were here earlier while I was testing the technology, I did Ice Age Ponds. I've also done Building Stones. And previously, I've worked on projects in other parts of the country, um, also looking at geology and history and um, social interactions and how important rocks and uh, are to people and their environment, which is pretty much what this project's about. So I'm going to go through this. Hopefully I've got a clock beside me. I will get through this all in one go. So this is the project band background for our Birmingham Attic Boulders project. Um, although I'm guessing in this crowd, lots of you will know this, what is an erratic boulder? It's really, I describe them as a rock that's not from round here. Um, you get them in lots of places uh, across the country, but throughout kind of southwest Birmingham, north Worcestershire, so kind of Bromsgrove, Northfield, Cottage, around the university area, Selly Oak, um, that kind of area, we get lots of boulders, some of them very big and beautifully displayed, like this one at the bottom, um, some of them quite small. Um, I usually get asked about size, and I am going for large dog to small car size in that kind of range without getting tape measures out. Uh, and the key feature is when you look at them, they are not like the local rocks, which in this area are utterly irrelevant for this talk, but sandstones and mudstones. Um, the majority of these boulders, when we look at them in more detail, formed around 450 million years ago uh, from volcanic eruptions uh, somewhere in the Southern hemisphere. Um, and they've come to this area through the action of glaciers. Um, but it's the story of how they're here and what they do that's really exciting. So um, I like this picture. Um, I like to think that this is a geologist. I don't know it isn't, so I'm going to stay with it. So um, the Victorians knew about these boulders, but they didn't just know about them. They were hugely impressed by them and wanted to show them off and preserve them. So our project is kind of building on the shoulders and doing that again, bringing them back to the forefront. Like many things, they've changed in uh, excitement, um, but this was cutting edge. Um, and this particular project is the culmination of a huge amount of work by loads of people, uh, specifically someone called Roland Kedge, um, who's amazing, um, and a National Lottery Heritage funded project at Cottage Park. And we realised that there was a need for this kind of project to shout about how important these boulders were um, to this area and also to um, kind of the history and our understanding of how climate has changed in this area. And our main aim is to do just things like this, to tell everybody, to engage them, to put uh, interpretations and leaflets, uh, to do talks, to do events, just to really help people understand that these features that really are just sat around actually have real significance. Um, we received a grant of 112,000, nearly 113,000 pounds from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And the project started in July 2021 and will finish in September this year. And the interesting thing about this project is it's a partnership project. So it's not just us, uh, the Earth Heritage Trust doing this, but we're working with the Birmingham Open Spaces Forum. Uh, they are very heavily involved in all of the parks in Birmingham and many, many of the boulders we see um, that managed to survive uh, are found in the parks. The Lapworth Museum, based at the University of Birmingham and the Black Country Geological Society and it's exciting because with the knowledge and information from these partners, we're able to work with lots of different groups and learn an awful lot more and hopefully extend the um, way our project goes and what the legacy of the project is, because the more people we can tell, the better the protections will be in the future. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, uh, Beth. Um, you got a, part of a black box on your screen? It's blocking the content, sorry. Is yeah. that better? Yep, that's better. It's, it's, it's a small box now, so that's yeah, that's better. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, hopefully that will be high enough up not to interrupt any of the words. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. Uh, so, geology. I'm going to talk about this. Um, hang on, I'm moving my mouse. So, this is the local geology. And this is all I'm going to say is there are rocks underneath the Birmingham area, and it goes kind of Northfield, um, up to Rolly Regis and Edgbaston, mostly they're Triassic and Carboniferous sandstones and mudstones. 
However, for the point of this project, all that's relevant is it's not what the erratics are. So let's move on to what we can actually see. Um, what happens is on the ground in an area where there are actually very few exposures of real rock, things that you can really put your hands on, um, are these massive boulders. And people came up with loads of theories about them, like they do everywhere that you find these erratic boulders. They say that they've come here from giants, that they're meteorites. Meteorites are always really popular. Um, it's biblical flood. There are loads of exciting theories about how they got there. But they're usually very big and difficult to move. However, especially during the late 19th century, the uh, actual story of what they were, where they came from, starts to be understood. So the first thing to do is actually look at, when we say lots of erratic boulders, we're not kidding. There really were lots. Um, and it's a really exciting time to be a geologist. I think it still is myself, and I'm guessing I'm in the same kind of company. Um, but what you've got here is um, lots of people. We've had the origin of species. We've started to get the idea of time being a lot longer than the Bible had previously said. We're getting the idea of ice ages are starting to come in. And people are starting to understand that it hasn't always looked the way it does now. And one of the things people are starting to do is you've got a wealthy middle class who are keen to learn and engage and discuss and see and go out and do. And they've obviously got the time and money to get involved. And so we get lots of people going around and recording these boulders, not just in the West Midlands, but actually across the whole of this country. And I know that there are equivalent groups both in, um, in the continent and also in North America. Um, and they were looking at every single one of these boulders and putting a literal dot on the map. Um, you can see from this map, if you look in the area to the top of the map, the north, you've got Wolverhampton and Bridge North. You can see little circles and crosses if you get close enough. Um, in the very bottom corner, which is the area we're interested in, you've got this kind of arcuate curve with Frankly and Searchley just to the south uh, west of Birmingham. Uh, right down and right at the very bottom above where it says Martin is Bromsgrove. And those are really solid black dots. So it's not just putting a dot on the map. They've identified the rocks. It's interesting to note that they were doing this um, by usually basically describing what they could see, hand um, samples, uh, and then doing what I always describe as the breadcrumb method, which is going, oh, I've got a rock. What does it look like? Well, I've got another one. And just keep following that pattern and see where it takes you to work out where they came from. Um, and in this case, they were able to identify way back in the 1870s, 80s and into the 90s when this map was produced. Um, they knew that these rocks came from the Arenig area in North Wales, so the Snowdonia area. So they've identified them and said this is from there. Um, the ones in Wolverhampton have come down from South Scotland. You've got ones from the Lake District. We, for this project, not that the other ones aren't interesting, but for the purposes of our project, we limited ourselves. So we're looking at specifically the ones came from the Arenig area, occasionally interspersed with the odd um, new one that's come from somewhere else. Now, the reason that we have these wonderful um, maps is across the country, they really were very exciting. Everyone was getting excited about boulders in Bay Birmingham, it was because they didn't have any other rocks to look at, um, but they did have an awful lot of eminent people. So it was right place, right time. So they've got Professor Lapworth. Um, you've got loads of these people coming around across the country and recording right the way. Hull still has a group um, in Yorkshire and indeed in Scotland. And they founded what's called the Erratics Blocks Group. And um, at this point, their aim was, and I've put it on the screen, is to identify them. Their aim was not to talk about how they got there, why they got there, or it was just to say, we have found boulders, here is the boulder, here's a neat description. They have these fantastic report cards that they were expected to go out and fill in saying exactly where they were and how big they were and all the details of them. And then they would be reported back to this committee. And they carried on doing it in immense detail. I'm not sure where the people found the time. Um, however, when doing that, it does then lead to, as you'd expect, if you've got vast amounts of information coming up, you start saying, well, how did they get here? Um, and this is at that same time, as I mentioned, that people are talking about ice ages um, so uh, or floods, because we've had the kind of biblical flood people had talked about. 
um, and you've got ice going over the sea and big icebergs floating around. And people are trying to get their head around those kind of thoughts about how did they get here? And so the first thing is the Erratics Rock Group were saying, we're only here to discuss what we can see, followed by, but if while we're looking at them, it, it might lead to discussions. I can assume there were probably some heated debates um, if they're anything like a lot of the meetings that I tend to go to, where people are putting forward their points of view. Um, the other thing that's interesting is they were aware very much that part of the reason they were doing their job was because they were worried that these boulders were going to be destroyed and there would be nothing left. Um, and it's that same fear. Turns out they were absolutely right. Um, I wonder how many there would have been before they'd started, given that at this point, they're already saying um, they were very much newspaper worthy. They were written up. Everyone was talking about them. It was a fashionable subject. Um, and many of them have gone since their time um, because they left us these lovely maps with many dots, um, building them and smashing them and burying them um, to get them out of the way because they are big. Um, and it's those specific features what's left is amazing that they've survived and it's mainly down to the hard work of a very small amount of people um but i would be interested to know i bet there were loads more in advance that nobody talked about because they were just rocks that nobody needed so what have we got you've got this two types of rock in in case of this area most of the stuff around this kind of very bottom part of uh, Birmingham came from a Renig, as I mentioned. But you're also finding rocks slightly further north around Wolverhampton and across to Bridge North, and they've come down from Scotland. And the first thing I said they did was they did a map and they did all the dots saying, this is what we've got and where it came from. And then someone did what I would have said is the quite logical next step, which is just join the dots and say, well, OK, it must have traveled down this route. Um, and have I found anything else that fills that gap? And what that led to was this little map, it's 1879. It's actually earlier than the one I showed you before. Um, and they've drawn it in, and you can see quite clearly that there's two different directions of movement of ice. In fact, there's some sort of heading almost north. And the thing about ice is they can't cross. You can't have two glaciers where one just goes excuse me and the boulders just cross neatly and they carry on in their own individual way um and the, when you start off with the map you start with the data and then you start drawing conclusions this becomes quite obvious that something more complicated is going on so you get two problems associated with these boulders the first is as that map's shown um you've got all the boulders we know where they came from but they've come in different directions and that isn't possible. So that leads to the very definite conclusion that you must have had more than one ice age, more than one massive change in the history of Earth. And just allowing for that time starts to, again, really bring it out, the idea that time is a lot deeper. There's a lot more we can learn. It's not that short period of time. Things must have changed radically. It's interesting to note that the same year that Origin of Species was produced, um, several geologists came back from visiting France where they'd seen glacial deposits and um, the remains of extinct animals, mammoths, um, and human tools at the same time. And suddenly it was actually there have been people and extinct mammoths and, and, and all relatively recently. Um, and this starts to looking at that change in time and understanding how exciting all that new information must have been. So the first idea is there's been more than one ice age. Um, and I can see why that isn't immediately obvious in that every time ice moves, firstly, you've got to imagine, I mean, I know it's not warm now, but it isn't ice age like a massive change in climate to what you are used to. Even the coldest every day, you're not worried about walls of ice approaching you here. And in Britain, we don't have glaciers per se. So you, imagining that massive change in climate is a big change in our understanding, especially at a time when people really weren't traveling. But then to imagine that happening more than once um, takes another big leap of faith. And so you're starting to really say, well, how did this happen and what's going on? What's causing those changes and how long did they take? And the second one is, again, it's that idea of imagery is how did this happen? 
because initially when people talked about um, ice ages and especially in relation to the bit of ground that we stood on, um, they were talking about um, things floating. They were saying icebergs floating in the sea, carrying blocks in them that they picked up and then they were melting and dropping the blocks. Now, as you can imagine, you'd need an awful lot of water to flood to the centre of Birmingham, um, an awful lot of water to have big icebergs floating around. Um, and in fact, um, finding these erratic blocks at the top of big hills, um, there's Romsley Hill is a good example. They found some at the top of the hill, at which point you start saying, nah, there's never been enough water. And I think the idea of that big um, iceberg, firstly, it's quite easy to envisage. People have heard of icebergs. They're kind of known about, um, even though they wouldn't necessarily have seen them. So they're easy to put into someone's mind to conjure that image up. But then there is the point at which you say this can't have been that. It helps you cling on to the idea of the biblical flood, um, that huge volume of water that's come from somewhere and flooded everywhere. Essentially, although ice was involved, it's more down that line. However, um, in 1882, Reverend Kroski, we'll talk about later, who was one of the very key influencers in the Erratics Blocks group and also in describing what was going on in the Birmingham area, found scratches on rocks. And he said, that's evident for movement by glacier rather than iceberg. Um, however, old ideas that are easy and stick in people's heads do last. Um, there is actually an article from 1905, and it talks about the fact that this particular boulder was dropped by an iceberg while floating over the Midland Sea, when that period when Great Britain was an archipelago of ice-clad islands, which does make it sound much more exciting than it was, um, which is very cold and under a massive glacier. And these scratches were formed as this feature plows over the landscape, erasing what's gone before. So the idea that you'd find the traces of earlier ones is slightly hard to get your head around because every time the ice plows over it's a bit like a bulldozer it takes the top layer off and then deposits its own features as it makes its way back retreating so what actually is the geology that our project is looking at well it's what's happening in the arenic hills in wales um, and what you've got is some uh, a nice it's a lovely environment you've got ash fall tufts uh, and some quartz, and we find them. Um, and as I said, initially the identification was done very much by hand specimen. This rock looks like that rock, and I've traced the little crumbs of the same kind of rock all the way back. Um, these are uh, pictures showing you, uh, I didn't go on the field trip to go and have a look at these, but these are what they look like if you're there, um, some large specimens of them to give you an idea. And how did they form? Well, they formed in the Ordovician and quite handily for us in terms of talking to the general public, it was 450 million years ago, give or take. Um, during the Ordovician period, the bit of land that is now Britain was in the Southern Hemisphere um, and this bit hadn't joined to Scotland. As that ocean closed, um, you get lots of volcanic activity. And what you get is huge amounts of volcanoes. And it's that volcanic rock or volcanic activity that we're now seeing. Um, it's an awful lot to take your, get, wrap your head around in those changes of times, especially if you don't tend to talk about um, the changes to the Earth's surface uh, on a regular basis. And lots of the people we're working with don't tend to think about it. So you can imagine these huge volcanoes, very much like Pompeii, um, giving us these volcanic textures. Um, when we work with a lot of kids, we say we're like detectives. We look at what we've got and then try and trace the clues. Uh, in this case, we look and we can look at the samples and we say, well, what can we see? We can see examples where things have weathered out. We say there's a large fragments. We can see where pumice has been flattened. We describe it. Um, the size of them is massive. This is a huge one on private land, um, but they are these huge boulders, but they obviously don't look like anything else. And we say, well, how did these form? And we look at modern examples um, and Pompeii is the one that people have definitely heard of. And we say, well, this is a pyroclastic flow. And so what you've got is those subducting plate. We get a massive pyroclastic flow um, with this rock and debris. Really glad I wasn't around at the time. Would not have been good. 
um, very violent, very viscous lava. And when we find these types of rocks, obviously we don't have a volcano like that now, um, but we look for something similar. Um, we are working out what we've got and saying, well, this is what it was like then. Um, and this is how they form, because we know that rocks that look like that form today. Um, and then we, as I say, we look and go, well, where did this come from? There must have been a volcano. We've had a look at it. It's in non-volcanic whales now. Uh, drawn, draw the dots. And then we say, well, what happened next? And this is the bit where we just gloss over it. It's always a joy to be able to gloss over lots of time. Um, the Earth is very old. So stuff happened. And we're going to ignore all of it until we get to around 450,000 years ago. That's why I said it's always very nice when these numbers match up. It's um, very easy to describe things to people. If you go 450 million years ago, there was a big Pompeii-like volcano. Um, and then 450,000 years ago, what happened in between is fairly irrelevant to our story. Interesting on a planetary basis, but for our story, not relevant. About 450,000 years ago, we've had lots of ice ages. Um, and it's that variation actually causes us to have some discussions I'll bring in. Um, and it's in those ice ages. One of them the, during the Anglian period is thought that quite a lot of the um, material that we've got may, I'm being cagey deliberately, may have been brought to this area. And then there would have been another ice age. So you've got stuff moving during the Anglian glaciation. This is the largest one would have made it down to roughly kind of the very bottom of the country. If you were in the south coast, Devon, Cornwall area, you wouldn't have been under ice. Everyone else certainly would have been very cold. Um, and when you were in the Midlands, like we are now, you'd have been under ice. Um, but this wasn't the only ice age. There have been loads of them. Um, and then another ice age comes and brings with it new material. This is just to do with where the snow falls. So if you've got areas where um, in the hill ranges um, during the Devensian, um, you've got stuff happening in Wales and maybe it only gets into Herefordshire. Um, during the Anglian, you might have stuff forming in Scotland and stuff forming in Wales uh, on the mountains. Snow falls, hits top of the mountain. You need a large amount of snow falling. Well, weather being weather, it will vary slightly in different areas. And in the area where you've got slightly more accumulation, your glacier is going to come down, be slightly quicker in a race between two glaciers, um, uh, which is why you can have stuff coming from Wales and stuff coming from Scotland. The stuff that the slower glacier, if you like, hits the faster one. Um, and you've got two different periods. One's bringing the stuff from Scotland and it got there first on a fast glacier. And then the next time we've got the stuff coming from Wales. Um, certainly it would be nice if it was the Anglian glaciation, just because 450,000 and 450 million are really nice and easy to remember. Um, when these glaciers reach our area, whichever time they did it, they're going to hang around. The weather's going to warm up. Climate's going to warm up. They're going to retreat, depositing all the stuff that they've brought with them. This is stuff that could ride on the top, it could ride in the middle, or it could ride underneath. Um, depending on where you are as a rock depends on what you look like at the end of the journey. So if you have sat on top uh, and basically hitched a lift, you're probably going to be quite angular. Um, if you have uh, gone in the middle uh, or definitely bumped along the bottom, you are going to have had your corners knocked off. You're going to be scratched potentially. If you are anything other than a very hard rock, you are going to turn to dust. You'll be rock flower um, and you're going to make up that clay of the uh, diamict on the boulder clay um, that has been ground up and deposited um, because you just couldn't take it. Um, it does explain why a lot of the stuff that's later that we don't see. You don't see all the sandstones and things because they're just too soft. They can't take this level of um, crushing and grinding and bashing against other rocks. Um, they just wouldn't survive the process. Um, we do see some scratch marks, um, although I mentioned that lovely picture of the stone that Krosky did and he saw scratch marks and said, oh, this must be a glacier. Um, it's a great conclusion, but actually in terms of looking at the um, erratics we've got, um, certainly in the West Midlands and the kind of South Birmingham area, they're relatively unusual. We don't see that many of them. So he, 
he drew a very big conclusion that's probably definitely correct but actually it was quite a bold statement because it turns out there's not that many of those particular types of erratic now there's a fantastic little video um that i would love people to go and look at on our website um, produced by uh, the son of someone who came on one of our walks, got really excited by the idea of this ice moving, and he created this wonderful stop motion video. Um, I've just taken a few stills from it to kind of show the idea of you've got a glacier in Scotland and a glacier in Wales, and they raced their way down. Um, and it, the idea that um, the stuff in Scotland was a bit slower. So the first ice age comes, it carries with it boulders, they're fantastic little black dots in this, and they cruise along with that ice age. So you've got the picture on the left showing the Eredig area with some little black dots near that A, um, and those are those boulders. And they've been picked up, maybe they've just fallen off a cliff, landed on the glacier, um, and then they're carried. As the ice age deepens, we get advancing of the glaciers across the plains in Cheshire. And at this point, there must be a greater accumulation of ice and snow in Wales. It means that that ice is moving just slightly faster than the ice coming down from the mountains in the Lake District in Scotland. So it carries these boulders down to Birmingham. Well, the idea was around 424,000 years ago. And then, that glacier retreats, leaving those boulders left behind. Um, if you look at the picture on the left, there's a little bee in the bottom corner. That's those boulders happily sitting around Birmingham. There's then the Devensian Ice Age. Um, and at this point, um, this glacier coming from Scotland is moving more quickly. And what happens is the um, boulders coming from Arenig only make it as far as Wrexham. And they that um, ice flow hits the Scottish one and kind of just stops. It builds up, they get built, deposited there, and then we get lots more ice coming down from Scotland, which is why we find um, a lot of the Scottish boulders further up north near Wolverhampton. That ice then melts, and that's uh, one of the theories about how we've got these boulders from Wales and the boulders from Scotland um, very near each other because you couldn't have had them cross the kind of the two paths couldn't cross uh, and if they'd come together you'd sort of expect both at the same time and we don't see that um, so it's a fantastic animation uh, if you get the chance do go and have a look at our website however I'm being very cagey with my description um, because there's been some other theories and um, there's been some quite recent work although it is building upon the work of people previously um, where they started to do something to do with um, cosmogenic nuclei dating. Um, and one of the things they did, really excitingly, is they actually tested some of the erratic boulders in our area. And this was to look at whether the Wollstonian glaciation had a much bigger part to play than had previously been mentioned. As I say, it seems to have been quite popular early on in the kind of 60s, um, this Wollstonian uh, glaciation, this one forms about 170,000 years ago. So in between the Anglian at 450,000 years ago and the Devensian glaciation at between kind of 30 and 25,000 years ago um, for the glacial maximum. Uh, and at this point, there's one in between. There were lots, um, but it appears that this one may have had a much bigger influence on this area than had previously been realized. Um, there's a lot of work done over in the Fens and on the east coast of Britain talking about the impact it had there. Um, there's a recent piece of research um, by Gibson et al. Uh, it was only published uh, last year, in kind of May last year, and they looked at um, exposure dating. And although most of what they did wasn't on erratic boulders, for reasons that I'll explain, um, what they did was they were essentially saying, if you know when your boulder was plucked off the cliff and carried by ice and then exposed to, well, the sky, um, you get, as once everything's exposed to the sky, you get cosmic radiation, um, got cosmic rays, um, and they cause new isotopes to be produced. And we know the rate at which they're both produced, um, but we also know the rate at which they decay, which means you can say how long that particular rock has been exposed to the atmosphere, um, which can give you an idea of how long something has been exposed. Now, the thing with these boulders is they don't stay still. Firstly, 
um, when you get them, they can be flipped, they can be rolled. If they are in the middle of a field, farmers could choose to bury them, they could choose to move them, they can put them under trees. There's a lot of things that could um, stop the um, cosmic rays reaching them. And also, if you just roll it over, um, they don't penetrate very deeply into the ground. So you could definitely change um, the proportions of these slightly. And we know that a lot of these um, large boulders have had this happen. The ones that were chosen for this research were the ones that we had the most faith had least likely to have been moved. However, it's very difficult to say for definite. But the dates from them do suggest that they are more likely to have been moved during, during the Wollstonian. Although whether that was the first time they'd been moved or the second and they'd come down in the Anglian and then reworked is very difficult to say. Um, they also did some um, work looking at um, luminescence dating, not of the boulders, but actually of the um, sediments around the area. Um, and they gave a um, the same kind of information um, it, in a different way. In this case, you're looking for when they were buried rather than when um, they were exposed. Uh, and what they found out was in general, and there is some variation, but we think that probably is due to the way the stones may have been rotated or moved or exposed or buried. Um, it looks like they probably weren't deposited before the Warstonian stage. Now, as I said, there's lots of caveats with how this actually would have worked with the case of boulders, um, but we're quite excited because it's always nice to see some new science done. So although for the purposes of this project and our general work with the public, we're still sticking with 450,000 and 450 million because it's just nice and easy. It does look like um, actually at the very least there has been some definite reworking of sediments um, and potentially actually the um, stuff that came to Birmingham came during the Wollstonian stage, not the Anglian stage, um, which means they came even more recently, still quite a long time ago in the scheme of things. Um, I've mentioned all of these, if the boulder has been ro rotated or buried, or um, what I didn't mention was if it had been exposed, say, in the first glaciation and then moved, um, it might give you a different number because you've got some um, exposure information from its first uh, exposure and then you move it, rotate it or anything, uh, and it could result not will, but could result in an overestimate. So it is really hard to know, but it's exciting that new research is taking place um, and looking at these boulders and actually trying to say what part of this, um, they're part of the story, especially um, because it's an exciting story that people have looked at and it kind of went out of fashion. So I don't want to say what's definitely happening, but it does look like there's a good chance that the um, boulders actually came uh, or at least were reworked during the Wollstonian glaciation which is i have to say like a secret glaciation that nobody ever talks about because they talk about the most recent the venzian or the biggest the anglian and this one actually seems to be quite exciting but very secret not sure why i'm gonna have to work on that one tell everybody now the thing about this project that's really captured people's imaginations is not it should be the excitement of the wallstonian glaciation or indeed the ordovician volcanics it's actually what's happened and how these boulders have been part of people's lives for a long time. So I wanted to show you some of the key features of that. Um, and I mentioned previously that I think one of the reasons these boulders were so exciting is because the right people were in the right place at the right time. The science of glaciations being uh, coming up, it's the new cutting edge, latest must discuss thing over the dinner table um, or a cup of hot chocolate or whatever. Um, equally, You've got the right scientists visiting and Birmingham is booming. People are doing loads of excavation work. They're not doing it for geology, but it's a nice byproduct if people are constantly putting new roads in and new, digging new housing estates and then reworking it to make it look nice for people. Um, it meant a lot of these boulders were exposed. So one of the people who was key in this is Charles Lapworth. He was the first professor of geology at Mason College, later became the University of Birmingham. Uh, this is him sat, sitting next to what we now call the Aston Webb boulder, um, which is in the grounds of the University of Birmingham. Uh, and he recognized its importance. He's a picture of him sat next to it very oddly because there's no buildings today. There are loads of buildings surrounding it. 
And he was influential because he was the teacher of lots of other people, including Lewis Barrow. Um, lots of people wrote to him. He also answered loads of queries. Um, and he was um, one of the people who was involved in the Erratic Spot Committee. And he recognized, again, um, it, when there was a threat to some of the boulders, he was saying, no, these are the only tangible evidence of that ice age, which I think is something that is still true today and easy to forget, is that as you stroll around Birmingham, actually that whole part of the history, whether it was the Devensian, the Anglian or the Wollstonian glaciations, there aren't many rocks you can touch. And if you want to get people excited about their history and what was happening, it is so much easier to do it out there in the real world with real rocks you can really touch. And these erratic boulders are those real rocks and they really have got a story to tell, but it's explaining it to the right people. And he recognized their value for that, for showing people the history of this part of the world. Next person I want to talk about, next hero, as we call him, was Reverend Henry Crosskey. Now, if ever there was someone who I swear never spent five minutes sat still, this is the man, because he was that busy. He was a Unitarian minister. He was a key education reformer. He was a founding member of the um, Erratics Block Committee and secretary. And um, having had to do secretary works in meetings, that's no mean feat. He also went out and repeatedly visited and recorded erratic blocks across the region. It wasn't just that he was typing up what other people were showing. He was the one doing it, too. And he was um, influential in saving at least one um, erratic block. So this is Cannon Hill Park. They dug out the big boating lake. And when they're doing it, he was um, key in making sure that this particular boulder went on display for public benefit. One of the things I really like is not only did he get them saved uh, in the case of there was a lady right at the beginning wearing her lovely Victorian outfit with some railings around it, but there was actually interpretation. Uh, I think that's really exciting because it's not just it's not enough to just save the rocks. You want to share your knowledge and enthusiasm so people understand why they've been saved. Why are they sat there? What is it that they're actually looking at? Um, he went round, as I say, never sat still for five minutes, very busy. And one of the things that happened is over 700 samples of erratic boulders that he collected are now in the Lapworth archives. That's a lot of boulders to find and sample and take home and then donate to the Lapworth. It's fantastic that he did. It gives us a fantastic resource to carry on using. Um, but it's one of the reasons we think he's definitely a boulder hero. And finally, the one I'll talk about is Lewis Barrow. Um, he was, again, another person who was the right place, right time. He studied at Mason College. And one of the things he did, not the main, but one of, was geology with Charles Lapworth. Um, he must have been a very promising student. Um, he was related to the Cadbury's family through marriage. And he ends up being the chief engineer at the Bourneville Works. And he must have been a geologist who was working in engineering because every time they found a boulder, he wanted to preserve it. He had them moved. He recorded where they were found in great detail, measurements, looked at them and then put them in the parks. He made sure they were moved to areas people could see them. Um, he wrote about them in the Bourneville Works magazine. He was very, very diligent, both in rescuing them and recording them. Uh, and it's thanks to him that we know anywhere near as much as we do about numerous of them. He constantly writing to Lapworth. He was another one of these people who was always going out and finding things. Um, and a lot of the stuff that he did gave us the background to the idea that um, people were really interested in this. And he was keen to share it. And obviously, lots of people were keen to learn. Um, I mentioned the Bourneville Works magazine. Um, this was a fantastic thing. Everywhere should have one of these. Uh, I think it's the newsletter of its day. Um, and it had articles on everything, concerts, photography, people who were working at the Bourneville Works um, were putting in things about the latest must have, whether it's a theatre trip or whatever. And he started writing about the erratic blocks in this. This is just for workers. This isn't specifically for geologists. It's just about telling people what's going on and what we found. Um, and the first article about erratics appears in 1906. Um, and they carry on. Lapworth writes in, Barrow writes in. They have diagrams. They have pictures. Um, we're really lucky that um, we got access to this uh, thanks to Mondelez International uh, and the Cabris Archive. 
um, and we were able to see them and read the articles. And we're thrilled because not everyone uh, kept such diligent records. And the last hero I'm going to say um, is someone called Roland Kedge. We are thrilled to say he's a rock hound. He knew about the erratic boulders, especially the Great Stone in Northfield, um, which is exciting in itself because there's a pub named after this particular boulder. There's a road named after this boulder. But he did a huge amount of work to both get the boulder um, protected and then get a plaque talking about the significance. Um, and it was through the hard works and the repeated efforts of him finding boulders and saying, I keep finding these boulders. They're really interesting and telling everybody. And it's because of Roland that a lot of the work for this project and the previous one at Cotteridge um, have taken place. It's because of his ongoing dedication to preserving and uh, telling people about the value of these. So he's not wearing a top hat and sporting a big beard, but every bit as much a hero in protecting these rocks. I mentioned that um, Lewis Barrow was really keen on making these available to the public. And I think it's one of the things that is really exciting about these boulders is that it wasn't enough to find them and record them for science. They wanted to share them with everybody. And in doing that, there were a lot of public parks as Birmingham's being massively developed. They're creating these green spaces for people to exercise. Um, it was very good for you. It was the place to be seen on a Sunday um, and you were going out. And one of these was Cottridge Park. And in doing all the landscaping work, both within the Cadbury's factory and indeed within the park itself, lots of these massive erratics turned up. Um, uh, here's a great picture of them showing them. And they decided rather than bury them again, rather than smash them up and use them to make roads, they would create this absolutely wonderful kind of boulder garden. Um, I really like this picture because for anyone who's ever visited Cottage, can't recommend it enough. It's fabulous and has the most wonderful team of people keeping it going. Um, these trees are still there, only they're no longer these tiny little saplings. They're these massive, fully grown trees. Um, and what they did was wherever they found them, they recorded where they'd come from. They put them on plinths. They even, and I love this, they put some information for posterity so that sometime in the future, people might find it useful. I'd love to know what was written on that time capsule uh, underneath one of them. They then uh, did diagrams. This is from the Bourneville Works magazine saying exactly where in the park every single one of these little boulders. And as you can see, at one point, it's, there were 23 of them. I mean, they really wanted people to know about these boulders and say, these boulders are here. They're for you. They're in your park for you to see. Um, and the idea was, as it says in the magazine, um, this was at the time this was happening, um, that they wanted people to know what England was like during the glacial period. And I think that's fantastic. They didn't. It wasn't just about science. It was about sharing this fantastic discovery with everybody. Um, and again, the idea of interpretation, I mean, I, I love an interpretation panel. Um, I love going somewhere and going, I wonder what this was. And there being something to tell me. But one of the things that um, was realized really early on was that it wasn't enough to just have these boulders in this place where people could see them. You had to explain what they were and how they got there. And they put in a wonderful interpretation panel. Um, uh, they called it an indicator panel. And in it, it says um, where they came from, how they got there. Uh, and they put it right next to the boulders so that everyone coming past in their Sunday best would get to learn a little more about how they got there and where they came from. And I just think that's a really fabulous point. It's what interpretation is for. It's about attracting people's attention and informing them. So today you can just see uh, there was this wonderful indicator panel. It's because of the Bourneville Works magazine. We know what it looked like. There are far fewer boulders. I mentioned that lots of them are getting lost. Even within the park, they've been moved, smashed. History doesn't record what happened to them. And in other places, they've been really lost. Um, they were maybe dug up and buried. People don't want them. They're maybe in some private gardens. That'd be great. I'd love one in mine. Um, so that's what the boulders are, and where they came from. And this is just the last bit to end up with what, a little bit about our project itself. So we're planning to do eight walking and cycling trails um, to try and encourage people to visit lots of them. Maybe you can become a boulder bagger and visit lots of them. Um, or maybe just as you're going round, as lots of people seem to do, is suddenly going, 
I've walked past this loads of times and there's another one down by there. Oh, there's hundreds of these. And by seeing one and learning about one, you discover just how many of these fabulous features are all around Birmingham. Um, we've had lots of fantastic volunteers create the trails, uh, other volunteers, equally fantastic, different task testing them um, and uh, giving us loads of advice and helping us tweak them. Um, we've done four already. There are four more that will come out this year. Um, we're really excited to share these with people because they are a lot of fun. Um, although it has to be said, as a pedestrian, I'm not going to be taking on some of the cycling routes, but the boulders are worth seeing. One of the things we've done is a bit like uh, Barrow in his one is where we found them. We've helped move them. Um, not very far uh, in Selly Manor. They've now got a little boulder garden. Um, they were brought there previously and we've just helped them rearrange them. It was incredibly hard work. The volunteers who did it are fabulous. Um, we also have moved some much, much larger ones at Woodgate Valley Country Park. They've not been moved very far, but it's allowed them to be next to the path. Um, this path is fully accessible um, and we hope that this will enable more people to find out about these fantastic features, which otherwise were just, you know, a few metres away, but in a hedgerow. There's been loads of clearance work going on. We've been discovering them. Fantastic kind of um, pressure washing them. It is really satisfying. Um, I don't know if you can see in the picture on the uh, top right hand side, the before and after shot. It's very much like a fancy shop for uh, washing powder and things. And for the people who did in the Illy pastures, a really impressive boulder clearance, they did it in the worst weather and the ground was very muddy. Um, and they hoped to find out how big this particular boulder was. Turned out really big. They didn't find out how big it was, much bigger than anticipated. We've done loads of public events. We've worked in parks. We went to Coco Mad. We've done some really fun stuff at the Lapworth. Um, talking of the Lapworth, this massive boulder on the left that you can see um, was the same boulder that you saw Lapworth casually leaning against when there was nothing around it. Um, this was a fun event we did at Lapworth Museum. We've uh, had an exhibition at the museum. Uh, where we had just a temporary exhibition, but we were able to show people where they were and what they came from. And um, just over 16,000 visitors uh, visited. And we're even more excited to say that having had that fabulous reception in the Lapworth Museum, it's now going to Dudley Museum and Archives because they've got their at least one, that Illy Pastures boulder, uh, turns out to be just over the border. Uh, and they've been as enthused by our great volunteers and their findings, and they're hoping to do something similar. Um, we had loads of publicity, very unexpected. It all escalated. Uh, there's a poster here, a missing poster, but just was a small thing created by a great volunteer called Julie um, that was just to attract attention at a little event at Roheath. Um, and the right person saw it at the right time. And it was obviously a slow news week. And before we knew it, we'd been on everything. Um, it was a roller coaster ride, but very exciting. Another way we wanted to share this is it's not just geologists we were trying to attract. We love doing public events because we get to meet people, but we wanted to look at the different ways you can start to interpret this. So we've been working with an art group at Frankly Library. We've done some textile art workshops. We're working with a guide group to create artwork to allow us to create some kind of art based trail in Frankly itself that will tell the story of from when the rocks were produced 450 million years ago and what happened um, if you were a boulder watching time pass, what would you have seen uh, during the different geological periods? Um, although it's not the same kind of story, it's really important to engage different people in different ways. Um, and it's been really exciting looking at what they've done. Uh, and finally, not all these boulders are going to survive into the future. We're doing our best to shout about them and tell everyone how great they are in the hope that once you know how important and why that boulder is still there, it'll be preserved. But we've created a fantastic interactive map so people can go and have a look and go, oh, there's another one and oh, there's another one. Um, we've had people going out and being rock hounds and finding them, whether that's on private land and just saying to people, did you know that's 450 million years old? Um, or failing that, um, we've put them on trails. And finally, we are working to designate a couple of them as local geological sites. So at least they'll be considered in any future planning. This won't protect all of them. But at least if we can shout about them and jump up and down, it may, pe may make people stop and think. And hopefully in another hundred years time when people are looking back, they'll be looking at these boulders and going, wow, these boulders are still here. That will be the work of and will be part of that story of sharing the interesting lifetime of these boulders from their creation in a volcano to coming here in ice 
Wollstonian, um, we should shout about that more, um, and then their preservation during the Victorian period when it was cutting edge science. And now when we want to reconnect people and help inspire them to understand how their local geology has shaped exactly where they live. Sometimes it's just a small feature in a park, but others, it's quite a big feature. If you live in Northfield, Great Stone Inn and Great Stone Road very much are there. And this is that great stone. And this is the story that stone has to tell. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I've inspired you to go and visit some of these many boulders. Um, they really are worth seeing. Um, and I think if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them.